I, I got to say, you know, I was um, the only person in my class through elementary school who was Chinese. And so that immediately kind of um, made me really stick out. And um, sometimes it was really tough because I, I grew up in Headbangerville and some of the fellows were real mean. Well, certainly when I was growing up, there were a lot of really negative attitudes towards gay people, a lot of really negative attitudes attitudes towards native people, people from different races. It was not exactly the most positive and progressive place to grow up. Um, and so a lot of people, myself included, uh, experienced bullying while we were in school. Um, some people, you know, more than me, um, you know, but it was, it was brutal. It was a difficult time. I remember my uh, teenage years were really difficult. I would uh, go home uh, each night and lie on the couch because I felt so alone. I was a really nerdy kid and I went to an arts elementary school and I was really quite chubby so I used to get picked on by a lot of the dancers who were the popular kids. Um, I liked to read a lot so I spent a lot of time reading and making up really elaborate games in my head and I didn't have tons of close friends so I spent a lot of time with my teddy bears. Um, mm. and One of whom lives with us today. It's true. There was this guy who I think he was about a year younger than me. He was sort of a little bit more feminine than I was or anybody else at school, and he was taunted, he was bullied, he was called names, and the thing that really stands out for me is I didn't do anything about it. When I started school, I found out pretty fast that my color was a problem for a lot of people. I got pushed, I got punched, I got called all kinds of names. School became a really scary place. The school had a uh a motivational speaker come in to the auditorium to kind of give us a, you know, talk about whatever. And um, his theme, general ideas, his general idea was uh, t that he was trying to tell us that these were the greatest days of our lives. I remember being told all the time that these are the best years of your life and you must be having so much fun and I didn't know anyone who really felt that way. I quickly realized that that guy was uh, not only totally full of shit, but um, he was kind of a little irresponsible too because he was, I mean he knew better, he was a grown up, so he must have known that what he was saying was garbage. Um, and he was basically telling out, you know, a huge room full of, you know, disgruntled, confused, depressed uh, adolescents that this was the best that their life was ever going to be. Oh, and I got chased once <laughs> as well by, a, by a, just a gaggle, gang of uh, teenage boys who had seen my girlfriend and I holding hands on the bus. And that sort of seemed okay in Toronto where we'd started the bus ride, but by the time we got to Bowmanville, it started to seem very dangerous. The scoliosis and the way that I looked was the most salient thing about me. It was the most obvious thing, and that's sort of how I got defined for a while. And people would call me names like Quasimodo and all kinds of horrible stuff. There, there were a couple guys that just would relent, you know, unrelentingly make fun of me um, for being Chinese. They'd call me flat face. They'd be, you know, kind of like thick. And it was, it was a bummer. There was a couple of guys who, uh, who literally chased me in the hallways at times. There was, uh, there was bullying and it was abuse, and I didn't know it even then. And I didn't tell anyone, and I wish I had. A bigger kid came up to my brother and me and lit a lighter. And he held the flame in front of our faces and said, I'm going to burn you. I wasn't picked on for being gay or queer, as I wasn't. Um, but it doesn't really matter if people perceive you as different. They might, you know, because you're different, they might start calling you faggot, which I was called plenty of times. Um, and they'll latch onto that and their friends will latch onto it. And it just becomes this never-ending spiral of torment for that person who's on the receiving end of all this and for a long time that was me. I remember people did call me names, you know, I got called fag and faggot and, and gay. They sort of see me from across the street and I, and, and I was trying to sort of avoid making eye contact and they started screaming at me from across the street, hey faggot, what are you doing here? What are you doing here faggot? Get out of our, get out of our town. And um, I, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't think I was gay, and I, and I um, have learned that I'm not, but at the time I, I would get called that sometimes because of the way I looked, I suppose. You'll feel like you won't accept yourself. You'll believe that you aren't worth anything, and uh, 
I just, I, that is just so devastating to feel. I changed to an alternative school halfway through high school and suddenly I went from a place where everyone wanted to be the same to a place where everyone was different and they were all freaks and geeks and nerds and punks and artists and queer kids and it was so refreshing. It was like waking up from a nightmare. I did end up, you know, changing to three different high schools for a number of various reasons. At my final high school, I ended up hanging out with a disparate group of outsiders from grade 8 to 12 and all of us found each other because we were all marginalized and many of whom had been made fun of but we ended up, you know, like-minded people end up finding one another and I actually found some really great friends. I think that's when I really developed a sense of humor just as a way of protecting myself. I hung out with people who had weird senses of humor like we were all sort of quirky people and I think today, I mean I'm writing for a comedy show and I think it's in large part because going through something that was tough that helped me develop my sense of humor uh, at the time felt like a real challenge, but today is a real asset. When I was in my early 20s, I came out to my mother and she was the only person that I told. And I was sitting in the dining room one night uh, reading and she walked by and said, you know, life is a lot more interesting if you can go through it with someone else. And I laughed and said, that's very diplomatic of you. And she said, what, did you, what do you mean? And I said, well, you didn't say if I can go through it with a wife, you said with someone else. So you're basically saying it's okay if I'm gay. And she turned to me and said, it is. I was in my 20s in the early 1980s and that was when the AIDS crisis happened and a lot of people came together at that time because the thing that we were fighting was so much bigger than something as stupid as intolerance or hatred. And that was a moment when in history it was a very terrible time, but it got better for people personally because we came together and because we understood that there was a much greater enemy to fight. That feeling of aloneness disappears, you end up realizing you have this huge world of people who have experienced what you have and you can connect with them. Our first date was to a dog park and we both showed up and we brought our dogs and our dogs seemed to fall in love instantly and chased each other around and it was just... They're really lesbian also. <laughs> they are. I never thought I would be married. I am gay. I have a wife. I can't believe I'm actually married because I never thought I'd get married. Um, I have a child, <laughs> a three-year-old child, I never thought I'd have a kid. You know, from high school on, it's just this giant adventure. And in, in, when you kind of look back at it, high school is just this tiny, tiny blip. And, and I know um, it's the geeks and the freaks and the goths and the weirdos who get picked on that actually inherit the earth. We will get our revenge just by simply living good lives. I mean, the worst thing you can do as a kid is to believe that you, that you can't share what's happening with you with anybody else or that things will actually get worse. That's not the case. If you are having a tough time, um, one of the best assets that I had was a sibling and my sister was my best friend through that whole time. Talk to someone, reach out to someone. Talk to anybody you can. If you're not really sure who you can talk to outside your friends or whatever, there's the kids' help phone. They're 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, they're non-judgmental, and they'll be there to help you and, and guide you through this. There are crisis lines of various kinds, whether they're for adults or for children, it doesn't matter. It, particularly if you're feeling like you want to do some kind of injury to yourself, you must call somebody, you must talk to somebody. You do have a choice in life. You have a choice to speak up. You have a choice to tell an adult. All you need to know is that there will come a time, and it'll be sooner than you think, but there will come a time when you can just be you. Life is good now. Like Tony Kushner said, you are all fabulous people. Your day will come. Don't beat up on yourself. The tagline of this whole campaign, the, it gets better or whatever, I mean, it's a, it's a funky sounding marketing thing, but it's, at the end of the day, it's absolutely 100% guaranteed true. It not only gets better, it gets a lot better actually. And it becomes amazing.